Podcast of Poseidon is a spoiler-heavy podcast. That's an understatement. We're going to discuss not just the events of this book, but the Rydenverse as a whole, and really anything that we feel is relevant. You can find full spoiler warnings in the show notes. Ooh, should we tell him? Should we tell him now? No, let's wait for next episode. No, wait. Okay, we'll wait. We'll wait. Okay, episode. we'll wait. We'll wait. Next episode. Just a little more. Just a little more, guys. You guys will know. You'll hear it. I'm so excited. I'm so excited like to it. tell them. Hello, mortals, monsters, and myth lovers alike. You're listening to Podcast of Poseidon, where we explore how ancient myths become modern pop culture, breeding Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson and the Olympians. This is Chapter 39, Atlas. I'm your co-host, on loan from the Hunters of Artemis, Darian Smart. Joining me is my co-host and brother, hailing from Antwerp, Netherlands, DJ. How's everybody doing today? Antwerp, Netherlands, you know, it's a, it's a fine place. It's, it's got good weather. It's got a uh, pretty rich history. You know, the works. The works. All right. All right. Sounds Sounds pretty good. So before we dive in, let's real quick just swing by the camp store to make sure we have everything we need. DJ, I believe this is unprecedented. What is? For the first time in back-to-back episodes, we have another review. Oh, let's go. Yeah. Uh, This one is from Jakey with just a bunch of nines and eights, and and I love that vibe so much, Jakey. Uh, and they gave us five stars, thank you so much, and said, one of the best. I absolutely enjoy this podcast. As a 27-year-old guy who grew up reading the books, I love how these podcasters are able to spin the characters slash monsters we meet in the books and how they are perceived in other media. I also really enjoy the different versions of each myth. Don't be like Zeus! How sweet. Thank you so much, Jakey. Thank you so much. This is the second review we've got that have ended in Don't Be Like Zeus, and I just want to say, y'all, I love it. Love it from the bottom of my heart. I love it so much. It just deeply satisfies this like vain little part of my creator brain that got so excited when I came up with with that to to end the episode. So you don't have to, but if you want to leave a review, talk about what you like about the show and ending it in "Don't be like Zeus." It's just it's just fun. It's just fun. It's Thank so you guys good. so much. It's it, it yeah. does like bring a smile to our face every time we see it, and like every time we see a review in general, right? But we see that little thing. It's like, oh, hey, oh, nice, yeah. It's yeah, it's awesome. It's super cool. It just really builds that that I don't know that feeling of there are people out there listening. We are not just. I can see the download numbers, but <laughs> yeah, actually right. hearing from y'all does make it it's seem awesome. Real, yeah. Uh, if you would like to leave a review and just say what you like about the show, we would love to hear it. You can do that at lovethepodcast.com forward slash Poseidon Pod. And that link will show you literally every platform you can leave a review on with your device. It's super simple. Thank you guys so much for leaving reviews. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And speaking of things we appreciate, DJ, it's a new month. It's a new month. That means we got a donation to give out. We do. It is time for our monthly Patreon donation. Uh, If this is your first time tuning in, every month we donate $1 for every patron we have over on Patreon to some organization that is working to create a net positive in the world. And it's June, which in here in the U.S. means it's Pride Month. So, of course, we're going to pick a good LGBTQIA organization to donate to. And this month, uh, we decided to go with the Community Center. This is a local charity that... Well, it helps out the LGBT community here in Boise. The Community Center is committed to uniting the LGBT community through educational and developmental programs by providing resources to the LGBT community. There's a lot of really great organizations we could donate to, but I definitely just felt compelled to give locally this month. And and to our patrons, and honestly, to any of our listeners, if there are any local organizations you feel like deserve a little bit of support throughout the year... Please feel free to hit us up on Instagram or email us at PoseidonPod at Gmail. I, we'd love to know about other places we could support throughout the year. Absolutely. We currently have six patrons over on Patreon, so we're going to donate an additional $20, bringing our total donation to $26. Thank you guys so much for making this donation possible. And now, back to the show. All right, DJ, we have a big one. 
quite literally uh, in quite terms of large, mythology. Quite a large, large man. We were a talking large about man. Today. Yep, yep. It is Atlas, which notably, DJ, is our first Titan. He is. You are correct. Yeah. Yeah, he is the yeah. first Titan that we are talking about, even though maybe we should. Should we have talked about Kronos? Or should we? We have I know we're waiting for probably Last Olympian, right? I think uh, it's. I, okay, so I sneak peek. Here's my logic of it Percy hasn't actually met Kronos yet. <laughs> so. So, okay, so, all no. right. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, here's the thing Percy hears about Atlas through a dream early in the book. But we're covering him in order now at the end of our season because that's when you properly meet Atlas. Okay, so I have okay. – there is a really, I will acknowledge, bizarre internal logic that I am <laughs> operating on vis-a-vis episode structure. But um, I do like the idea of saving Kronos for Last Olympian now, DJ. I think I will just commit to that. Maybe okay. that will be our first episode of the Last Olympian. I don't know. Okay. But yes, Atlas, DJ. What do you remember about Atlas from the Percy Jackson books? From the Percy Jackson books, uh, he's obviously working for Kronos. He's called Mm -hmm. the General. Yeah. He got Luke to take the sky from him so that Luke could trick Annabeth so that they could all trick Artemis. Yep. And he didn't really kill his daughter, but he kind of killed Zoe. The prophecy outlined that one will die by a parent's hand. So yeah, but if he killed if Zoe, was, if it was just the wound from Atlas, Zoe would have lived. It was a mixture of the wound and uh, the poison. True, but if it was just the poison, Zoe would have lived, and exactly. the poison happened first. Right? Yeah, yeah. But it's like. Also, he was know. definitely like, trying to kill her. I guess it's an assist, her. right? I guess it's an it's assist. It's an assist? So, so he doesn't get the full XP? He's got to share it with Landon? Yes. That's so distressing. <laughs> or does Landon have to share it because it was Atlas who actually... I, I don't like this comment. We're done. No, the, what I can't. it is, is in most Darian. games, it's last hit. So, mm-hmm. it. oh man, did she, did she die from the poison? Or did she die from the injury? She died from the injury, but they were exasperated because she was already weakened due to the poison and and the uh, because the, the dragon it's not like he fed her a bottle of poison like he bit her, okay, so she already had the dragon wound. Yeah, then it's a fucking it's a debuff, and she got clocked by <laughs> Atlas. <laughs> oh no! She got rocked by Atlas, and that that uh, Atlas got the last hit, so he got a maj- the lion's share of the XP. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, and thus, why we feel no remorse for Atlas for his punishment. No, no, no. his punishment of holding up the sky. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is. That's yeah. That's it. Basically, <laughs> there's not a lot. There's not a lot here. Full no, disclosure, he shows gang. Up for like not a lot scene. to Atlas. Like, no, he's really more of a a symbolism, symbology for an idea than a reoccurring yeah. character in myth and pop culture, but. I, I want to talk about just a little bit something we don't usually do on the podcast, which is talk a little bit about storytelling in the Percy Jackson books. Because with Atlas, Rick Riordan introduced a really interesting concept. The book is called The Titan's Curse. And we learned that the titular curse is the curse on Atlas. He is forced to hold the sky. He has no choice. Yep. And this is a curse that can only be bestowed on a titan. You cannot force anyone else to take this burden. Like, no one else could be coerced or tricked into doing it. They must willingly accept it, which is why, as you said, DJ, it was Luke to do it because that was how they were going to get Annabeth. And then that was how they were going to get Artemis Artemis, because they wanted to trap Artemis. And someone had to hold up the sky. Like, they couldn't just leave Luke there. He would eventually die. And then the sky would crash into the earth. And that's game over for everybody. Nobody wants that. So it needed to be a deity of some sort, and that's Artemis. And then at the end, Percy, which I... Okay, I'm going to... I know I'm off on a tangent here, but I feel like, fandom-wise, Percy taking the sky from Artemis doesn't get quite nearly enough... No, it's absolutely not, tr- not. That's a fucking killer yeah. scene. It's an amazing scene, and it says so much about Percy as a character, and it... Especially when Artemis is like, hey, fucking stop doing this shit. Stop yeah. it. You will not be able to hold the sky. It's like, well, Annabeth did, so the fuck out, I'm going to do it too. Like she has a heart of a maiden! <laughs> Percy's like, well, come on. 
You you got it. He's like, you don't know ah, if okay. I don't. You don't know if I don't have a heart of a maiden or not. You don't I surely know me. have a heart of maiden. <laughs> Let's find out. No, but it's like this goddess is telling Percy, if you do this, you'll die. And then he says, then I'll die, basically. But he's like, but Percy knows you need like he's like Artemis needs to be part of this fight. We yep. are not going to win this against Atlas without you. So Percy throws himself on the line, and it's it's a great scene. Um, but then Artemis is able to force Atlas back under the sky, freeing Percy. So that's yeah. the curse. Only a Titan can be forced into it. Everyone else has accepted. Did you? What do you think about that as a concept? I think that's. I think that's super cool. Honestly, I think it is kind of nice. But like, I mean, I don't know where I was going to go with that. I like the concept. I mm-hmm. think it's fun. I think it's a bloodline thing, which is like can be interesting in a lot of ways but also can like just also be kind of a cop out and like eh, you kind of whatever right uh-huh but i do like it being like oh well atlas uh is a dick so only he could force it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah because it's it's part of uh this transitioning into uh, we know in the 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 books it's established that this is his punishment for siding with the against for going against the gods in the titan war for being on the losing side and and that is in line with the mythology Mm -hmm. so we see uh, oh side note just real quick so this is where atlas stays for the rest of the series yeah he doesn't they don't even like bother with trying to help him again (laughs) no they no other titan is told to take on this bird and like no one else like chronos just leaves him there because he failed and he's not. Cronus isn't having that shit. Yeah. So, so we've got Hesiod's Theogony is where we were like. This is where we're introduced to Atlas as a Titan who you know fought against the gods. Not all the Titans did. I don't think this is something that we on the podcast have talked about. Not every Titan f- sided with Cronus against Zeus and the Olympians. Some of them sided with the Olympians mm-hmm. and weren't punished. Until later. We'll get to that. But he was given the worst punishment. Like, I mean, Kronos was really chopped to pieces and thrown into Tartarus. And even even still, Atlas has what is considered the worst punishment. Yeah, I would consider Atlas's punishment worse. Mm-hmm. For sure. To describe it in, the, in, the, in this passage. To bear on his back forever, the cruel strength of the crushing world and the vault of the sky. Upon his shoulders, the giant pillar that holds apart the earth and heaven, a load not easy to be borne. And there's this description of him staying in the place where night meets day. It is never night. It is never day. It is always that place where they are both meeting, which is interesting because the Hesperides were the nymphs of the evening and like the golden light of sunset. His daughters, who are the ones that we meet in the book, uh, guarding the apple tree and Zoe Nightshade, Rick Sosie, do not steal. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're considered daughters of the evening or nymphs of the west. Sunset. So that's that's fascinating. He's also the grandfather of Hermes. Hell yeah. Just citing back to DJ, uh, I believe you described it as the Olympian family tumbleweed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hermes' father is Zeus, obviously, and his mother was Maya, who was a daughter of Atlas. Because Atlas just had like a lot of daughters. Like a lot. And I'm not sure why, because I don't feel like that's common in other characters. I mean, Zeus, like the, the gods have a lot of kids, but yeah. Atlas specifically has a ton of daughters. Uh, Maya is one of the, the Pleiades. Of the constellation. I'm not sure. It's, uh, it is a little strange. Yeah, I'm curious. I don't know if I've, in, in the digging, didn't see any sons of Atlas. So I wonder, there's probably some sort of thematic reason for why that is. Though I do not mm. know it and actually didn't draw the connection until this point in time. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, when... When was the story of the him of it saying that he like exists in the place where it's neither day nor night? It's always both. When oh, did the that story come out. Do we know? Oh God, the Theogony. Let me find out. Yeah, because I just wanted to be like, oh, did they like? Because the Greeks were already like pretty certain that the Earth was round at 500 BC. Mm-hmm. The Theogony. Uh, was composed between 730 and 700 BC. 
Mm, okay. So yeah, the Greeks, most ancient cultures were aware the earth was round because math. Yeah. And like, 240 BC, they found out its circumference and everybody knows the story of the obelisks in Egypt and some other place. Yeah. See, that's not. Listen, that shit is just really cool. Like, yeah. I think they need to, they need to teach that to kids way sooner than when you actually learn it in school because you're sitting there doing math and you're like, this sucks. I don't. Or if you're the kind of kid who like doesn't enjoy math, you're like, this sucks. I don't like doing this. Why? I'm never gonna need to do this. I don't want to have a career with math in it. If you just like let kids know, like, hey man, in the past, this is what they used to find out the earth was round with obelisks. And I'm not saying that would instantly make kids love math, but I'm saying you could probably get some kids to be like, all right, fine. Fine, I'll do it. I'd get the history buffs in on math, but like Yeah, so you'll really... get the so you'll get like the Darian kids in on math, the history buff. Everyone else is still like, okay, but I don't like it. But math is that's really cool. Not fun. Knew a lot of people like that that just didn't like math. I didn't understand it. Mm-hmm. Aside from the the big Titan War. Oh, I guess side note, this is gonna come up later. Another speaking of daughters of Atlas Calypso. Yeah, Calypso, classic. Mm-hmm. Love her. Classic. <laughs> and we will circle back to Calypso next season, gang. We're getting there. But besides the Titan War, the other big appearance of Atlas comes from the labors of Hercules which we talked about with guest Robert some episodes ago. I don't think I can do as much justice as Robert did. So y'all, y'all know the drill. Is Calypso battle? I thought she was last. No, she's battle alive. Hershey she gets, yeah. Man, I thought she was last Olympian. <laughs> no, she's in battle of the labyrinth. Yeah. Wild. The, honestly, battle of the labyrinth, aside from the labyrinth scenes, battle of the labyrinth, the last Olympians really do just like mesh together in my mind. You're not, that's not an unfair analysis. I think a lot of the vibes are really similar. It almost like, it almost feels like it picks up like right where it left off, even though I know there's like a six month skip. There's a bit. Yeah. It's, I think it's the big labyrinth ends at the beginning of the summer. I think Olympian picks up at the end. Because that's when Percy's birthday is. Uh Uh-huh. So that's, that's the other big one. Now there is another story about Atlas. This other legend names Atlas as the king of Mauritania, which is a legendary kingdom in North Africa. And this king was killed in philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, just, you know, your real Renaissance man before Renaissance men were a thing. Classic. And he was said to have invented astronomy and the celestial globe, which if you don't know what the celestial globe is, you've very likely seen it. It is the depiction of the night sky in globe form, all the constellations, mm-hmm. all the celestial bodies. It's cool because uh, Atlas in Smite is actually carrying that thing around. Yes, we are going to circle back to that, DJ. But yeah, okay, I love that. This guy seems like a pretty cool dude. Very like educated intellect king type deal. But his mistake was getting on Perseus's bad side. Yes, that one. Uh, apparently, there was a prophecy that warned him that a son of Zeus would try to steal the golden apples from his orchard. And so when Percy rolls, well, Perseus rolls up on one of his quests looking for hospitality, Atlas denies him. And if you remember from our episode on the Odyssey, you don't do that. Yeah. Hospitality was kind of a big deal to the ancient Greeks. So Perseus being, you know, ever the reasonable gent, just uh, whips out the head of Medusa and turns King Atlas to stone. <laughs> and so the, the name is from the, the, bo- the... Basically, his body becomes the Atlas mountain range in, mm-hmm. in North Africa. So you have this massive mountain range, and, and that's the, uh, the, the myth behind it, which is just wild. Love to see it. <laughs> you do love to see it. So... There is, as we said, the atlas holds up the the sky. Essentially, mm. it was believed in in the Percy Jackson books. There's this it's idea like of where, in, if, in how you're in your mind, how did you depict that spot? Oh, that's a really good question. That's I I will admit sometimes when I have a hard time picturing what a thing looks like, it is kind of a blank spot in my mind. Really? So for me, it's atlas, and he's. I guess it's like a cave, 
It's like if you're in a cave and you see the ceiling of the cave starting to come in down to almost a point. And so Atlas is kind of beneath this thing that has become almost a pillar. And he's holding up just this single pressure point of where, like if you take out a blanket and you hold it at the ends, but it's still going to start to sink into a point Uh if you don't hold it taunt enough. I think the sky isn't held taunt enough, so it's coming in at a point. And so that's what Atlas is under. So it's not, I know I said cave top, but I still don't even picture it as being hard as rock. I feel like it's malleable, like you are beneath something that is like heavy, but like a bag of flour almost as you're pressing into it. I viewed it in a similar way. Uh-huh. But it was more solid, right? It was more along the lines of all of a sudden, like, it just came into view. Like, the air was solidifying in that cone cylindrical shape. And mm-hmm. it was flat, flat, and you're holding it like that. But well, it's like you a, could fly a above way to it, hold like, right? Shit. Yeah, but you yeah. could, like, go right above it. Like, it's not really connected to the sky, but it is, you know? That's a good point, because you could definitely... It's not really the sky, but it's something. Some... Yeah power some element that cannot be allowed to touch the ground essentially so that's a good question thank you dj so as you said atlas is forced to hold the sky but if you've ever seen a depiction of atlas he's like a modern one he's often depicted holding the earth Mm -hmm. which is not the same thing no I have a distinct memory of uh, the Wishbone episode of The Labors of Hercules, of Wishbone going to Atlas to get the golden apples. And so Atlas gives him the world, this big globe, and then the little Wishbone dog balances on on the tip of his nose. It's very cute. DJ, do you know why this imagery of the Earth has become a stand-in for the sky? Because a lot of people know that the sky is kind of not actually something to be held. Uh, not, not quite. It actually has to do with Atlas in Smite holding the celestial globe. <laughs> that is how Atlas was per- per- depicted. Portrayed. That's the word. Wow. Depicted in classical art to demonstrate this concept of holding the sky. Because as we think we just explained, wow, that'd be really hard to demonstrate. Yeah. Someone is holding the sky. What does that look uh, so like? So he was holding the globe and then mm-hmm. like modern depictors would replace the astroglobe with the earth yes exactly that uh it's where we get the um idiom carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders Mm -hmm. dj Hmm. you want to tell us a little bit about uh antwerp netherlands real quick (laughs) the antwerp netherlands when i said it had a rich history the only history that i actually know about it is the fact that the dude who published the first world atlas Abraham Ortelius oh. was born in Antwerp, Netherlands. Oh, interesting. Okay, I have a different guy, but it's yeah. it's four different things. Okay. Are you talking about like the cartographers that he hired to help him? Maybe. Because he did like he did contract like four or five other cartographers to help him with it. But he's just the one that looked that like came up when I searched when there was the first Atlas published. And it was Abraham Ortelius. No, yeah, that's super interesting because I was in. No, I think, no, this isn't incorrect. Yeah, he created like this first concept of what is considered the first true atlas in the modern sense, a collection of uniform maps, Uh, sheets, situating text bound in the book. So, yeah. DJ, you had some comment earlier. You were talking about some uh, comments on the atlas itself. Oh, yeah, dude. If you guys haven't seen this atlas, this thing is actually kind of crazy, right? Because... Goddamn, one, Antarctica, huge, much bigger than you see on like our normal maps, right? Fucking massive. Takes up like Probably. a good third or quarter of the whole world. More accurate to Antarctica, I'm sure. I don't know. Antarctica's pretty small comparatively to the world. It doesn't have it doesn't even have the same landmass as a uh, what is it? Russia. Okay. Now that tracks. It probably just is big because It's big because it's flat. Yeah. When it's like when it's stretched out across the whole world on the bottom, when it really is just a s- small circle. If I take mm-hmm. a circle and stretch it out, it's gonna look a little bigger. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Also, South a- South America looks goofy. Very wonky looking. They're like Africa's pretty accurate. It looks like they mm-hmm. had a time to really map that one out. 
Asia's getting there. Mm -hmm. It looks like they're missing the North Korean Peninsula. Uh Uh-huh. No Australia. Australia's Australia just not is there. Just not there. Nowhere to be seen. Well, this is the 16th century, so I think that probably tracks. Yeah. I can't even see. I wish I could take it. Like, oh no, DJ! I found stuff. Australia. Did you? Where is it at? It's on the other side of the map. Is that one really Australia? I think that's Australia. No, that, I think that's just the island that's off the tip of of Antarctica. No, I, that is, I would bet money that that's Australia. I mean, it's small, but it's kind of the right shape. And it's in roughly the right region if you were to slide it over. No, because here's the thing. Australia (laughs) is just below the Philippines and like the Indonesia. It's not to the left of it. Okay. But North America doesn't look like that either. So the way you're doing. Dude, look at at Alaska. (laughs) Yeah. You don't (laughs) have satellite imagery. In this era, what you have is ships that are making it as they travel around the coast. It's very difficult to read and another get... language. Yes, yeah, so and then you have a bunch of different versions. And when you're trying to map the whole continent, you're probably, it's not one ship that did it all around the continent. You're getting a bunch of like, all right, this guy said it looked like this, and this next piece looks like that, and you're piecing it together that way. But That's cringe. When, okay, fine. Here, hold on. <laughs> this... Atlas was published in 1570. Okay. When was Australia discovered? 1606. They didn't fucking know about that shit yet. Okay. All right. All right. Fair. <laughs> I, th- I, you know, I feel like I was reasonable, but I did not know. Europeans discovered it in 1606. That's fucking wild. That's huge. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was right. You were right. All right, may I introduce you to another map maker from the 16th century? So this gentleman is Gerardus Mercator. Sure, I'm so sorry to (laughs) everyone. (laughs) Literally one of the pictures is Gerardi Mercator. Gerardi, yeah, that guy. (laughs) Gerardi uh, Mercatoris, yeah. This guy. So, well, Abraham may have created what is considered the first modern atlas, This is the guy responsible for why we call it the Atlas. Mm. So he created a whole book of maps. Like he was a cartographer. That was his passion. And in his second collection, which was published in 1589, he mentions King Atlas in the preface of the book, noting, I have set this man Atlas, so notable for his erudition, humanist, and wisdom as a model for my imitation. He was referring to King Atlas we mentioned earlier, who got on the bad side of, uh, I almost said Hercules, Perseus. <laughs> and as we mentioned, as we talked about earlier, this guy was the Renaissance man. He invented the celestial globe. Actual Renaissance dudes would have been really into that kind of guy. Mm. And so I think Mercator? Mercator? Sure. So sorry. He, he didn't name it the Atlas, but he referenced it essentially to connect him to Atlas, who he viewed as like the world's first geographer. And then that just kind of became what we call collections of maps. That's why they're called atlases. Nice. Yeah, that's just really cool. I think that is, I mean, clearly a far less well-known version of Atlas in kind of this modern era in which when we retell Atlas stories, we very usually see the Titan because I think it's a very, like, powerful imagery. Mm. This idea of, like, one being literally holding the weight of the world on their shoulders. We uh, we see this in Encanto, in Luisa's song. There's a bunch, oh, that song nice. is a bunch of, like, visual images and stuff because she is describing her feelings and her emotions. And so we, the audience, are seeing it play out in these kind of a little surreal visuals that aren't really happening as in the case with most other songs in Encanto, but this is really cool. And there is one time where she is essentially like holding the entire house there inside her casita, or maybe it's the world. I don't remember, but like on her shoulders to dim. And she's super strong. DJ, you haven't seen the movie yet, but her gift is that she is incredibly yeah, I strong. Know. I, I at least know like that character because of that character. Tell DJ he should watch Encanto. I'll get to it. We'll get to it. It's on the so, list. I thought that, yep. I thought that was really cool. I did find... So there's not a lot of examples of Atlas himself 
appearing in things beyond just like a reference or, or like was he in Percy Jackson? I'm mm-hmm. sure he's been in Xena and Hercules. I at this point stopped looking because it just have, it's not really fun to talk about things we haven't really watched or been able to yeah. really strongly engage with. Atlas Shrugged by Anne Rand is a, a big one and, uh, you know, but the sim- the, that's what we associate, the symbolism, right? That's where we get Atlas usually. Mm-hmm. I did find one weird outlier that I'd like to tell you about because it's got a little oh, absolutely. wild. Absolutely. I'd love to hear it. So it's a Mickey Mouse cartoon. Yeah, classic. Well, it's a French Mickey Mouse comic strip. Okay. From the early 70s. Ooh. And I will not try to pronounce the French name because, <laughs> no, thank you. I don't need that kind of uh, ire in my life. But it translates roughly to Mickey through the centuries. And it, picture, it features Mickey Mouse as a time traveler. And at one point in time, he assists Hercules on his 12 labors. In this one, Atlas is the king, essentially, mm. with a passion for map making. So his whole, he actually, instead of them stealing the apples, the apples are oranges. And in order to get them, Hercules has to help King Atlas build a large globe and then <laughs> carry it to the right spot. Nice. So they like kind of did... Both. They did like the King Atlas, the geographer thing. And then they also did Atlas kind of carrying the world and having like the golden apples, which is very interesting. Just wasn't prepared, but I'd love to see more of that blending of of mythology because we talk a lot about there's a bunch of different versions of these myths. And sometimes they are very drastically different, as I would say, Atlas the Titan and then King Atlas are. Mm hmm. I think it would be cool to see those different versions kind of being blended cohesively into kind of a more of a solid narrative in in storytelling in these retellings and see what comes of there rather than picking one or the other. Yeah, that's a that's a fun one. I like that. Yeah. Did you want to talk about Smite? Sure. Atlas isn't Smite. As mm-hmm. I said previously, he is carrying the astrolabe. He looks, look this guy up. He looks like Lord Farquaad. Oh, I was not expecting, I didn't know what you were going to say at the end of that sentence. I was not prepared for Lord Farquaad. No. Wow. Okay. Hold no, on. He, he looks, he looks like this guy. DJ, I think I need you to look up Lord Farquaad. Yeah. I, oh, no, I see it now. Okay. No, as soon as I got the picture bigger and saw the facial hair. You are right. It is like Lord Farquaad had an Uncle Iroh transformation in after being swallowed by dragon. Yeah, once you get like up close and personal with his face. Now I see the Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially like his, in game. His facial hair should be way more raggedy. You know he's not able to maintain hair beard. He's not trimming. He doesn't have the he literally does not have the uh, yeah. the hands free for it. Does uh, he throw the celestial globe? Yeah. <laughs> Tight. He throws it. Uh, he also has the ability to, I, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like, it's essentially like manipulating gravity to where he can pull an enemy to him and to the globe if it's out. Uh-huh. Uh, and then his ult is he just unleashes gamma rays on you. Oof. <laughs> that's like really cool. Damage and shredding your armor. And then he can send it to do a little more damage, like send it straight and it goes in just a straight line all the way across the map. It's it's fun. He's fun. He's annoying. He's fun. Just a just you know the standard smite stuff. Just annoying, the standard, but yeah. fun. Annoying, but also fun. His skins are boring. That's because he doesn't have any yet. He's got he has just like, like he's... one, and it was the, yeah. The everybody's got recolors, right? Which is yeah. what it's like the standard. And then he's got one, which I'm not the biggest fan of. And oh, he just came out in Colossus. December. Yeah, corroded Colossus. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of it personally. I think that they could do better with it, and I'm sure they will soon. Kind of like Dark Side. Yeah, I really like the idea of that gravity thing and that association with the concept of space time for this character mm-hmm. that holds the sky. Yeah, and is uh, when he throws out his uh, celestial globe, he can attack from it, like it just pulsates and it slows mm-hmm. at the same time. It's fun. That is pretty cool. He's got some cool concepts, but right now his skin game is real weak. I know. I, I looked up because I was like, I bet this guy's got some cool skins. I'm like, oh, no, he's he just too came new. Out, yeah. <laughs> he just All came right. out. Right. He's got his Fine. skin game real weak. So 
here's something that we haven't done in a while. Oh, no. Do you want to play a game? Sure. All right, DJ. If you were going to do Atlas in a comic, in a video game, in a story, but you wanted to do something different with him, make him stand out while still holding on to those pieces that make Atlas Atlas, how would you do that? Like, how would you use an Atlas-type character? I guess it depends on the kind of media that I'm trying to go for, right? Mm -hmm. But knowing my character, I think it would be really fun to, say, have Atlas be the guy you get maps from, from around, like, you know, your oh, game. Yeah. Right? Like he, and he's, and like, whatever setting this is, he's chosen to wear an Aloha shirt that's just got the map of the world printed on it, fucking like goofy ass shorts, and the weight huh? of the world is a suitcase that he's carrying around. Oh, so he just travels and, and makes and he, maps he's got, and stuff. And he's got like, it's the suitcase, but it's like printed, or like printed, like yeah. whatever like that effect is. And it's like of like the sky and the globe and shit like that. And he's just wheeling that around. DJ, that's so interesting. Why, why those elements? What about those makes it Atlas to you? Well, obviously world stuff, right? Uh -huh. And like... But he's still, like, bound by his curse, so he still has to carry the, like, make sure that it never touches the ground. Oh. So it doesn't have wheelies. It doesn't have wheelies. Or does it have wheelies, like, and that's the worst. Yeah, oh, no, it's, you, it's one of the little... It. Oh, it's one of the little... Oh, I, I was picturing yeah. the wrong... It's like an old-fashioned suitcase. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's cool. the kind of... Like, the ones that, like, a briefcase, yes. I suppose. I don't know. But it's just, yeah. like, one of those that he's carrying around, and he opens it up and gives you the map whenever you buy it, right? Like, yeah. Whatever it is. Um... I don't know. I just think it'd, it'd be funny to see like this fucking guy walking around just like this. But like, again, doesn't matter the setting, right? It could be like medieval times and he's still in that Aloha shirt and shit like that. So very, un he is unchanged by the world around him. Very like Lore Limp is how it's going down, right? Love that. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's just like, oh, modern day in like Olympus and the underworld, but mm -hmm. still Greek and Grecian times. Uh, on the earth, which I think is like, it's a fun dynamic to see. And I just enjoy like any time a game does that. Right. And it's like, if I am to like make one of a setting of the gods, it would be mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And I think if in talking from just video game design, if you have your character, pl players want a map of the world. And so having the character they go to, to get their maps always stand out, no matter the setting would probably be really, really like, Oh, thank God. There he is. I can find him really fast. Yeah. So you're not running around I, trying to find him. Uh, there are like two different situations where this kind of happens, right? And it's like uh -huh. one is in Super Mario Odyssey. Uh, after you beat the game, Peach and Tiara, the crown that's like Cute. the sister of your of Cappy, uh -huh. just are in all the worlds dressed up in whatever world it is, right? Cute. Like they're just around there and you can find them and they give you a moon. And then in Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach, you unlock your map as you go. And the way you get that is from, uh, I think, like the information bot. And uh -huh. he jump scares you every time and then hands you a map and leaves. And I really like both of those ideas. I think it's goofy. <laughs> Including the jump scare part? Yeah. That feels like it'd get tedious real fast. Uh, uh, in... It only happens like five, like three to four times. Okay. Yeah. In uh, this made me think of like Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Don't you have to like find the fish to draw the map for you? I have no idea. I didn't play that oh. one enough. <laughs> Lucy's been watching a streamer play it, and I, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that's what happened. But if I'm wrong, y'all can correct me. It's fine. Yeah. I don't All mind right. on that. It sounds one. like I, something the Zelda not... game would do. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the so, thing, right? It's a very like grumpy fish, but he made the map, and I, it had a pencil, and I thought it was cute. I know. Uh, in Majora's Mask, how you get maps is you shoot down Tingle from his balloon, and then you buy the maps from him. Good. I feel like good. <laughs> I just don't like Tingle. I don't think that's a hot take. Like, yeah. It's pretty basic, but... He's a little goofy. He's, a, he's just a goofy little man. Mm -hmm. How would you depict Atlas if you wanted him Gosh. to be different? If I wanted him to be different. I guess as much like you said, it, was, it depends on the medium. But let's say I was doing a comic book or a graphic novel that had these kind of larger than life elements. Mm. I, I'm really taken with the gravity notion of Atlas presented in Smite 
And so I feel like, and if Atlas being this fixed point in all of reality, essentially, like where night and day meet, like this place that is nowhere where anyone else could exist. So as your protagonist, as the characters have to approach Atlas for whatever information, I like the map thing. I think maybe they're looking for something. They don't know where to find it, but Atlas knows where everything is mm-hmm. because he is, the sky is not just in one place. Right? No, like, it's all it's literally knows. stretching across the world. Yeah. So where Atlas exists is not truly in one place. Atlas is essentially encompassing all things. And that's where you get the the idea of the map because he knows all locations. And so as you approach like the way time and, and space and gravity are linked. So as you approach Atlas, this physical center of all things, I picture things getting really wonky. Right, like time starts to move, like the characters are maybe traveling together, but one goes a little faster, and then they have to wait so long for the other one to catch up. And the other one was like, I was just two steps behind you. Or now gravity is lighter, and they're like jumping and jumping as they're trying to approach Atlas as just this Mm -hmm. almost impossible to comprehend type figure. Yeah, it's pretty sick. Thank you. Yeah. We should do that more often. I think that's yeah. <laughs> listeners. Did you like that? I had fun doing this, the creative writing type that. thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't have much else on Atlas. I don't have much on Atlas. I just felt like Atlas was too important not to get a main feed episode. Yeah. He's just everybody. Just like oh yeah, he's the map guy, right? He's the yeah, but it's so much more. Oh yeah. Yeah, I was delighted to learn about how we got Atlas in a. As the term we use for maps. And I did. I love language. It's so weird. Yeah. Language is pretty sweet. It's always fun to just like trace back. It's like, oh, why do we say bull? You know? (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like how I hold on. I want to actually fact check this thing before I say it. Okay. This is factual. Okay. So it's like the the word Nimrod. Yeah. 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 It means you call someone a Nimrod. It means like, oh, you, you fool. Yeah. But it, used to mean great hunter and until Bugs Bunny got a hold of it. Yes, yes. In the book of Genesis, in the, the book of Chronicles, Nimrod is the son of Cush and the great grandson of Noah. And he's described as a king and a great hunter. And so you've got Elmer Fudd, who's a hunter. And when Bugs Bunny calls him, hey, Nimrod, he's like insulting him. It's like calling someone um, Einstein. Einstein, like, oh, hey, way to go, Einstein. Yeah, exactly that. But it's a reference that went over so many people's heads. Not as, like, you know, they were not smart, but just they didn't, a lot of people didn't get it. Or as those ca- cartoons have continued to exist, and that kind of, like, isn't so com- biblical, isn't so common knowledge anymore. Mm-hmm. It just came to mean, like, oh, he's obviously insulting Elmer Fudd because Elmer Fudd, Fudd is being an idiot. So I think the kind of Atlas for the map thing kind of evolved the same way oh, yeah. where he's like, he's referring to this as like, oh, an Atlas for Atlas. But it's like people think of Atlas as the Titan, not necessarily as the king. So it's an Atlas. And that's just cool to me. I like language. It's, it's language is always fun to just kind of like delve into the history of it. Yeah. It makes it so like, time. yeah, it's so alive, like storytelling. It's part of the storytelling. There are stories behind words and how they change. Hmm. And that's really it for me, DJ. I got nothing else. I really awesome. don't. Fabulous. Ooh, should we tell him? Should we tell him now? No, let's wait for the next episode. No, let's wait. Okay, we'll wait. We'll wait. Okay, episode. we'll wait. We'll wait. Next episode. Just a little more. Just a little more, guys. You guys will know. You'll hear it. I'm so excited. I'm so excited like to it. tell him. I'm so excited. Very good. I think, I think they'll be excited. But yes, so uh, that is going to be it for us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. It's always a blast i was really excited to record this one with you dj because it's just i like hanging out with you yeah it's always a good time yeah i hope our listeners like hanging out with us i assume you must you have let us be in your head for the past hour or so so no give or take somewhere around give or take so yep thank you so much for spending time with us if you enjoy the show and you think other people will too please take some time just to leave us a five-star review let us know what you like about the show why you keep listening it's a great way to help other people decide if we're worth their time, I can say we're great the whole time, but maybe I'm a little bit biased. But you, listener, right. <laughs> you are a true neutral party in this. So you can go to lovethepodcast.com forward slash Poseidon Pod. And it's going to show you everywhere you need to, everywhere you can leave a review. And we would really appreciate that. 
Yep. If you want more and you, hey, really enjoyed our Dragons episode last time, but we felt that our conversation on Charizard was left unresolved, good news, we took it over to Bunker 9. That's Bunker 9 on our Patreon. Yep. So for $5 a month, you can access that episode and hear uh, the thrilling conclusion of that that chaos, as well as literally access every single other Bunker 9 bonus episode that we have released. They actually come out on off week. So our patrons got get to enjoy content with us Every week. Every week. Yep, every week. And uh, that's uh, including, well, not every week when we're on hiatus. They still get the alternate episodes. But, you know, keep in mind, we do have a hiatus coming up soon. As soon as we wrap up this next episode for book three, we're going to take a little break. Mm -hmm. But our patrons, you will still be getting that content. So something to keep in mind if you're wondering, what am I going to do without Darian and DJ? We will be going back to the Twisted Tales because I had a good time with that. I have no idea if any of you guys did. Nobody commented on it. But I had a blast explaining those Twisted Tales. At the very least, no one hated it enough to tell us to stop. So I'm excited to go back to that well, too. No news is good news, I always say. (laughs) All right. But uh, in the meantime, so we will be back on Tuesday, June 21st, for the final episode of The Titan's Curse, in which we will discuss constellations. Woo, pretty. Thank you all for joining us. And until then, don't be like Zeus. Don't be like Zeus. Podcast of Poseidon is created and hosted by Darian and DJ Smart. It's edited by Darian Smart. The show is produced by Darian and DJ Smart, as well as... Tim O'Connor. The Crystal Con Man. Dionysus the Drunk. Our music is Athens Festival by Martin Hayne. And our cover art is by Audrey Miller. You can find her on Instagram at Bombshell Nutshell Art. Like the show? Ready for more? Support Podcast of Poseidon on Patreon. Just $1 gets you exclusive bonus content. Find out more at patreon.com slash podcast of Poseidon. Can't spare the drachmas? You can support the show by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or by sharing us with your friends. Find all of our episodes and episode transcripts at podcastofposeidon.com. Thanks for listening. 